Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of IEEE Brain uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Reza Abbasi. I'm, a, a, I'm an assistant professor at UCSF and currently serving as the education committee chair at IEEE Brain. Uh, so today it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Peter Bandettini as our guest speaker. Um, Peter is joining us from NIH, National Institute of Mental Health where he is a uh, chief at the section of uh, functional imaging methods at NIMH and director at the functional MRI core facility at NIH and INDS. Uh, and uh, we are more than excited today to hear about his exciting work on the challenge and opportunities of mapping cortical layer activity and connectivity with fMRI. Uh, so to our audience, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, please uh, use the Q&A box. Uh, you can type in your questions. Uh, I'll make sure to uh, cover them at the end, um, uh, perhaps summarize them, and we'll be discussing them with Peter. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Peter. OK. All right. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to get a chance to talk to uh, a wider audience than just the uh, you know, usual brain mapping community about, uh, about this really exciting uh, direction that fMRI is taking with layer uh, uh, layer ac activation with fMRI. But I'm just going to talk to you about some of the challenges, some of the work that we've been doing, some of the work that some of my collaborators have been doing, and uh, I'm trying to convey a sense of excitement about what it's capable of and how it's just it's different than just going to high resolution. Okay. All right. So, um, just to start by talking a little bit about the brain. The brain is you know, obviously incredibly complex and we're, we're finding many ways to try to understand it better, but it's organized across many different temporal and spatial scales. And we're still, you know, it's not clear of what the most uh, salient or relevant uh, scale is. And fMRI uh, mostly looks at the scale from you know, whole brain to systems to maps down to about a centimeter. And we can get a lot of information with that. Uh, what we're trying to do is actually get more towards the circuit level because uh, there's a lot, not only a lot more information, but maybe some uh, real revealing uh, 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 signatures of, of computations that are going on with the brain. So the, the depth of understanding will be significantly enhanced if we get to the circuit level. So the idea here is that, you know, there's many methods that have been uh, around for, for hundreds of years for, for, uh, and evolving rapidly for looking at individual neurons. And they're very invasive and they involve usually uh, you know, animal models. Uh, and of course, there's many ways of, of looking at brain activity with, with humans, uh, everything from you know, careful behavioral studies and looking at fMRI, looking at brain areas, mapping out the areas, uh, and even looking within areas, uh, like for instance, visual retinotopy, for instance, you can actually look pretty good within areas, but there's no, there has been no real connection between these. Um, and that's what we're hoping for with layer fMRI. And that is to look at uh, these types of organizations of which, you know, the brain is actually, it's much more complex than just looking at these areas. It's divided into columns and layers. And these layers have specific functions uh, that either uh, communicate information about the world or communicate information about our internal states uh, and how we uh, predict the world and, and interact with it. So it turns out that this scale might be extremely relevant and it bridges this gap. Uh, one other important thing is that many of these methods, they're extremely high resolution. This is sort of a plot of coverage, brain coverage versus resolution. And these can be very high resolution but usually they're limited to, to a tiny part of the brain. And one thing that fMRI has uh, uh, an advantage of is, is getting to whole brain assessment of, of at this high uh, spatial resolution, which is a huge advantage since the brain is highly interconnected. So there's many areas that are speaking to other areas to, to, and to truly get an understanding, you have to uh, look at how the areas talk to each other. So, uh, so what is the, one driving purpose of getting to layer fMRI. 
So instead of, uh, you know, typically with, with fMRI, we map out areas, but we really don't know how they're communicating with each other. And the idea is, is that in specific layers, and this is knowledge that we're still just getting from electrophysiology, but we have a pretty good understanding with specific layers, uh, there's a circuitry that depending on where you, what, where the activation is in the layer, you can infer whether it's giving output information to other areas or receiving input from other areas. So typically the middle of the layers receive input and the upper and lowers give output or feedback information. And it, it's much more complicated than that. There's a seminal paper by Felvin and Van Essen that outlined uh, the um, uh, layer connectivity and visual cortex. And we're still understanding that, but at least using this basic knowledge of input is, is the middle parts of the middle layers output uh, or, or feedback uh, information is uh, putting feedback output is, is an upper and lower. But that's different across different areas. Visual cortex is like this, maybe other areas. Motor cortex is slightly different. And uh, so you can actually get, you know, uh, hierarchical information about what areas are communicating to what other areas. So top down usually gives, uh, uh, you know, basically based on the activation, you can see it can, it can um, you can find out what areas are sort of speaking to other areas, either above the hierarchy or below in the hierarchy. And this will deeply uh, uh, aid our, our understanding of uh, computation in the brain. So in the motor cortex, it's, it's somewhat simpler. You have upper layers that are cortical input, uh, lower layers that are output. And, um, and so we'll get into that in a second to, in my talk, but, but also, uh, you know, some people argue that uh, you know understanding layer level activity uh, really will um, shed real insight into what in these models of the brain have been built for years. Is the idea is that it's a prediction engine. So you have uh, you know you make a model of the world and you receive sensory inputs and and then your uh, the rest of your cortex sort of has a prediction about what should be happening and it receives feedback and then it's modified. And where those computations take place is potentially at the level of uh, cortical columns and different layers of this cortical column. So this is just one example uh, of, of a paper showing sort of the schematic diagram of that, yeah, this, this computation uh, that takes place, uh, uh, assuming that the brain is a prediction engine, uh, takes place across cortical layers. And it's also interesting, there's other signatures of this, is that potentially some people feel that feed forward activity is, is gamma frequencies, so very high frequencies, uh, and feedback is alpha or beta frequencies, so other ways of understanding this. And so uh, we're trying to look at this, not only to understand capitation, but also looking at individual differences you know, with pathology or whatnot, that there might be some very, very clean biomarkers uh, that might occur from looking at this level. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about our methods. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the basis of functional MRI is neurovascular coupling. Essentially with brain activation, you have a small increase in oxygen consumption in the area, but you also have uh, substantial hemodynamic changes, flow, velocity, and perfusion uh, changes, volume, blood volume changes, and blood oxygenation changes. And all of fMRI is really based on at looking at this. Uh, there are many contrasts, functional contrasts available with fMRI. And the very early ones were with, with an external, you know, with an exogenous contrast agent, those died away very, very quickly once we realized that there's endogenous contrast. So the main ones in red here are bold, blood oxygen level dependent contrast, perfusion uh, using arterial spin labeling, and changes in volume, which I'll talk about the most, because it turns out that they have different specificities. Uh, and you can actually uh, combine these two to get at changes in CRMO2. And there's other sort of like experimental uh, and sort of ongoing developing uh, fMRI contrasts that are on the edge of either uh, usability or uh, detectability, uh, which, are, which are all potentially on the horizon, but I'm not gonna talk about those today. So the basic idea is that neural activation, you have all kinds of different neural activation. And uh, 
uh, you, that induces hemodynamic changes. And so we, we don't, we're not really that good at uh, yet differentiating this uh, using just the hemodynamic changes, but there's some work on that. And then we have the measured signal. We can measure many aspects of the signal. And in this particular talk, I'll talk just about the location of the signal, where it is placed on, on layers. But we also have other caveats. We have, you know, since uh, with MRI, we divide the brain into uh, basically three-dimensional pixels, which are called voxels. And we sample the vasculature very differently depending on what voxel we're looking at. And, and looking at layers, there's also this heterogeneity of large vessels versus small vessels, which all affect the signal differently. Basically, the more blood that's in the voxel, uh, the higher the percent signal change. So even for a, given, for a given amount of neural activation. So we have to try to look at the more homogeneous distribution uh, of, of blood volume, which is in capillaries. That's why we're very interested in looking at just small vessels because it's homogeneously distributed and we can draw more precise inferences about the magnitude. So we also have issues of noise. You know, there's thermal noise, but there's also all kinds of other noise, uh, physiologic and motion and cardiac that we're still working on trying to get rid of. And a typical functional MRI time series has a temporal signal noise of 100, functional contrast noise of one up to about 10. So it's, it's not that great. And even with layer fMRI, our temporal signal noise is down to 20. And this is just to illustrate another example of uh, uh, looking at the uh, cortical layers that uh, even here, the blood, um, the vessel sizes are not distributed homogeneously. Um, so we're trying to look at these capillary effects, uh, but, and, and these sort of this peel vessel and draining vein effects uh, have an artifactual influence using bold contrast, but not with vaso. Vaso, it turns out, is more sensitive to small vessels. And we'll get to that. So what's needed for layer fMRI? Well, well first of all, you need small voxels, uh, less than one millimeter, uh, preferentially about 0.75 or lower. And this is achieved with, you know, there's been many pulse sequence advances in, in making uh, acquisition more efficient, either uh, multidimensional acceleration or parallel imaging, and also multi-shot imaging. Uh, you need high sensitivity. Uh, the signal to noise is, is proportional, directly proportional, especially at these resolution, resolutions to voxel volume. So you can imagine if you have a 0.8 millimeter voxel volume, it's much, much lower uh, than a 0.8 millimeter voxel dimensions, much lower than your typical fMRI dimensions, which are two or three millimeters. So at high resolution, the SNR is about 40 to one, after averaging, it's uh, uh, that's only after averaging. You're typically working with about its SNR of 20 to one, which is low. And this sensitivity is achieved with RF coils, uh, localized RF coils with high lots of uh, coils uh, arrays, and also high field. And critically, you need high specificity. And I briefly mentioned this: uh, different pulse sequences are are, are good, but uh, they suffer from uh, 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 sensitivity to large vessels, intravascular signal, uh, arterial spindling is great for looking at perfusion, but it's incre incredibly low sensitivity. Uh, vaso, and another sequence that I'm not gonna get into called 3D GRACE is seem like they're the best. Uh, GRACE is a, is a combination of spin echo, gray and echo, uh, but vaso suffers from somewhat uh, low speed and narrow coverage, but it's improving. And you also need really, uh, different types of processing that can segment the brain into layers uh, and, and, and analyze the data in a slightly different way. And um, there's various po uh, processing packages that I'll briefly mention. So before I get into our applications and our details, I just wanna just talk very briefly about the problem we're up against in terms of sensitivity. And this is sort of a busy chart, but, but all I really wanna show from this is that this is te temporal signal to noise. Uh, we always have to deal with time series of data uh, versus number of time points. And if we typically have a TR of three seconds, this is about, this right hand is about 90 minutes, which is the upper limit of how much you can average per session. And it, this is just to show that if you, given a certain temporal signal to noise, uh, even if you have a really uh, generous p-value threshold in which you're trying to extract a significant signal change, uh, 
Uh, if you're looking for uh, an effect size of 1%, this is bold effect sizes or, or percent changes, either 1% to 5%, then you're going to be having to you know, average for 90 minutes to get that effect size. And um, you know, at five minutes, at 5%, you're in a lot better state, but it's extremely, as you can see, nonlinear, uh, anywhere from you know, 10 minutes to 90 minutes of averaging. And so we're up against that, that, you know, that cliff of, of not being able to see anything uh, when we're down to a temporal signal noise of 20 to one. So, and uh, another busy plot, but um, I just wanna show that uh, uh, going to high field helps substantially. So you have this physiologic noise ceiling that only comes into play when you have really low resolution, that physiologic noise has an effect, but then you have this thermal noise signal. So this is temporal signal to noise versus image signal to noise. And they should be the same if you had no physiologic noise, but, but um, they, they tend to become the same if you're thermal noise dominated, which we are at this range. And at 7T, at one millimeter, you typically have a signal to noise of about 40, but then notice if you go down in, in voxel size, it quickly drops off to uh, um, temporal signal noises, which are, are on the edge of not being usable. So, uh, so 7T is critical. Some layer fMRI can be done at three Tesla, and I'll briefly talk about that at the end, but uh, it's much more difficult. Uh, but there are advantages at three Tesla. It's, you know, uh, it's a little bit easier to image and uh, some of the relaxation uh, parameters are, um, are, are more accommodating. So as I mentioned, going to seven Tesla, uh, the, the advantages are higher signal noise. You have higher what's called susceptibility contrasts. So anything that has a different uh, magnetic field uh, um, uh, flux um, density is, is distorts fields more. And so that's a useful contrast, uh, especially with bold. Challenges, many, many challenges. There's RF heating, RF inhomogeneity, uh, the main field inhomogeneity and relaxation all become more difficult to deal with. So, uh, this is a nice diagram that's now mentioned Renzo Huber's name a lot in this talk because most of this work is directly related to uh, his contribution. He's been pretty much leading the field in, in layer fMRI. And I was lucky enough to have him as a postdoc. He's now at Maastricht right now. But he, he, he maintains this website showing all the, the seven Tesla scanners in the world. And you can see they're clustered around Europe and the United States and, and, and Asia for the most part. And but one thing that I want to say is that they're not just used for functional MRI. Mostly, at least this is worth looking at the scanner at, at my group. Um, we looked at the types of studies being done. Most are structural applications. And for at seven Tesla to really be clinically useful, it has to uh, be uh, useful for structural applications. And just as one quick example, these are two, this is just a seven Tesla image uh, in diagnosing um, differentiating MS uh, from non MS sort of pathologies. And what's really nice about 7Tesla, because it highlights susceptibility effects, uh, deoxygenated blood shows up as these dark veins, which is a beautiful type of contrast that doesn't show up as easily at 3Tesla. So you can differentiate uh, different pathologies more easily at 7Tesla. So it can be really useful. But regarding fMRI, and once again, this is a, a, a website that, that Renzo keeps, keeping track of all the papers that have been published with fMRI. And the field has pretty much exploded uh, in the, you know, from 2016 onward, uh, not really exploded, but it's, it's expanding rapidly. And, um, and you can actually refer to these papers using looking at this website right here. So um, one thing to note from these papers is that, yeah, after 2013 or so, it's sort of taken off. Uh, and most of the fMRI studies are, are being done at 7 Tesla with, or layer fMRI studies are, are being done in Europe, some in America, some in Asia. Um, it's, it's starting to, to take off a little bit more, Mo mostly in Europe. So this is Renzo. Um, this is his Twitter feed, and this is uh, his uh, email in case you're interested. Um, we have many other collaborators that, that I, I wish I could mention all of them by name because they're all critical. Uh, so this is our pulse sequence that we use. Uh, so uh, 
it's a simultaneous vaso and bold pulse sequence. And the idea with vaso, it's called vascular space occupancy. Uh, it, re it looks at blood volume changes with activation, whereas bold looks at oxygenation changes. And we're, we collect these both simultaneously. And the idea, the central idea with vaso is that you give an RF pulse that's able to separate blood from tissue based on the blood T1 uh, relaxation. So you wait till the blood longitudinal relaxation goes through zero, and then you image. And so you have no blood in these images. And so if you have a blood volume increase, there's a decrease in signal with blood volume increase. And so that's interesting. But what's most interesting is that it turns out, and we, we weren't expecting this, I wasn't expecting this, is that the blood volume changes are much more specific to smaller vessels than, large, than, than bold contrast and changes that that basically is an increase in oxygenation that then drains down uh, into the larger vessels. So just looking at the like a vaso versus bold image, you can see much more detail in the layers with vaso than with bold. And uh, not going to go into details here, but basically uh, saying that um, uh, we have a we from the, our simultaneous bold and vaso collected images, we just divide the bold images. Uh, to make sure that there's no bold contrast in our vaso images. So here's just a quick example of what, how the qualitatively the images change. So this is finger tapping, uh, going to higher resolution, higher, this is one millimeter, you still don't see much, but then at 0.75 millimeters, you see all this detail come out from upper and lower layers. And that's where we're going right here to, to analyze that. So I'm going to try to quickly go over these uh, categories, looking at sensory motor activation, cognitive activation, visual, and then some methods discussion. And I might have to skip over a little bit at the end, but um, uh, just to start out, and this is just a simple comparison uh, between vaso and other techniques. And I'm not, once again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically uh, vaso is sensitive to small arteries and capillaries. Brain echo is sensitive to blood. Uh, there's various types of spin echo techniques that, like I said, I won't go into, but um, are, are, sens are sensitive to small vessels, but they have issues. Um, and, and then also you can have a different type of spin echo that's sensitive just to capillaries. Um, spin echo is nice because it, it is sensitive to just these small compartments. Uh, but unfortunately, small compartments are all also red vessels in large vessels. So you need to get rid of the intravascular signal to truly make spin echo useful. So um, uh, uh, just comparing the sequences in terms of sensitivity versus specificity, uh, you can see they all fall along this, this line, whereas gradient echo is most sensitive, but it's the least specific. So if you look at gradient echo right here with the motor cortex activation, all the activation is in the sulcus, basically. It's mostly, you know, larger vessels. Whereas vaso, it's on the gray matter uh, ribbon. Spin echo is a, a mixture of the two. If you have pure spin echo, it's, it's okay, but it's not, um, but it's still, uh, it's lost some sensitivity. And then we have something that is purely T2 and without any intravascular signal, and there's no signals left. So the best sensitivity uh, specificity trade-off is vaso, which sort of jumps out of this curve. And another way of looking at it is this, this these trade-offs you have to consider, like resolution, brain coverage, speed, sensitivity, and vascular specificity. And with vaso, you have uh, wonderful vascular specificity. You have a little bit less, more of a problem with coverage and speed. Um, but with new techniques, uh, you can actually get whole brain coverage then. Um, with bold spin echo, uh, coverage is great, everything's good, except the vascular specificity is a little less. And with bold graded echo, uh, very fast, lots of coverage, high speed, very sensitive, but not much specificity, and this makes all the difference. And perfusion has great specificity, but it's uh, similar coverage as, as a previous version of vaso, pretty slow. Uh, because you have to use this inversion pulse, and the sensitivity is way less. It's not very good. One interesting caveat to all this is that uh, in terms of, so this is showing 
the bold percent signal change with visual cortex activation uh, along the cortical ribbon, along the layer, through the layer. And you can see clearly the difference between bold and uh, basal here. You have uh, bold contrasts much more weighting towards the peel vessel areas at the surface of the of of the of the layers. But with uh, with phaso, you have a nice hump right at the middle where you expect to see it in layer four. And so there's clearly a difference between bold and basal. Uh, however, it seems that the vasculature is organized such that within columns, if you look at uh, if you if you look at the signal across the entire cortical ribbon, there's not much difference. So bold might be perfectly good for non-layer specificity. And uh, and basically a preliminary conclusion is that bold might be better for detailed general high activation high uh, general activation discrimination uh, because it has a higher contrast to noise in vaso, but vaso is better specifically for layer-specific discrimination. All right, so our first study uh, was one where we, it was sort of a proof of concept study where we were doing four different tasks, uh, basically uh, uh, either tapping and looking at the motor cortex. So when you tap your fingers, the, the, cort the layer organization is that you have uh, sensory cortex and thalamic input uh, in the upper layers and spinal output and thalamic output in the lower layers. So as you're tapping, you're getting sensory input uh, that's feeding back to the motor cortex. Um, and when we do tapping with touch, we, as we expected, we see a double hump here of the input layer and the output layer. If we move our fingers without tapping, we reduce the sensory input and we also reduce the output a little bit. And so as expected, you have a little bit lower output here. And this is the looking at vaso. Uh, and with touch only, if we're not moving our fingers and just touching it, uh, we have only the input, a little bit of input, but not no output at all. And what's interesting also is with ipsilateral tapping, tapping on the other hand, you have seems to you seem to have a suppression of the sensory input from from in motor cortex. And as you can see, looking at vaso versus bold, bold is highly weighted towards the peel vessels. And you, it's, it's contaminated by this large vessel uh, effect. Um, so, so this is just another example of how CBV is uh, contrast is much more specific to layer activity. Um, we can also look at resting state connectivity with this. And we get very different maps depending on where we place our seed. So this is looking in the motor cortex, looking at resting state connectivity, relying on the fact that the brain is spontaneously, constantly active and communicating, even when it's not doing a task. And so the idea here is that if we take a seed area uh, in upper, right here versus lower, um, we can see that if we have a seed in the superficial areas, which are this indicated by blue, uh, you have sensory uh, activation, sensory connectivity which is expected. If you have a seed in the lower areas, it seems like you have it, the, the entire connective, connected region moves to premotor uh, areas. So there's very different areas that are, being, are constantly communicating based on uh, where you are placing your, rest, your seed and just simply looking at resting state, no task involved here. And, and this just shows we can switch it around and, and place and look at the layer profile depending on where we put our seed. If we put our seed in S1, uh, we get mostly upper layers in motor cortex, which is expected because S1 is communicating uh, uh, in the upper layers. Uh, if we place our seed in premotor, we see this double peak here, which is ind indicative of feedback. So uh, I wanna show this because it's, it's just a really nice example of high resolution less than, um, not, not layer activity, but, but, uh, but high resolution fMRI. And also brings out some of the challenges in high resolution fMRI. So here we have a task and everyone knows pretty much that, you know, the, 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 the motor cortex is, a, it has, is sort of a homunculus and you have the motor area and each digit has a specific area, but it's never been that clearly revealed. And so we had a task where 
uh, basically subjects alternated tapping their fingers, you know, thumb, finger, you know, pinky finger, whatever. And, and they also had a different task. And I'll talk about this in a second, where it's a macroscopic task of either expanding their hands or contracting them. And we found something pretty interesting with this. Gold, it was less interesting, um, but with uh, and less clear, but it was still there. But with Vaso, we found pretty clearly that, uh, first of all, this is sensory cortex right here. And you find that it, it's organized very clearly uh, as, as the fingers are organized. But in motor cortex, it seems that there is a digit organization that's sequential, but then it flips. Then there's a mirror image uh, digit organization in motor cortex. And this was really curious. This, uh, we've never seen this before. And we thought, well, let's try to better understand this by, by looking at a, a, a task that involves either expanding or contracting our fingers. And what we found is that with this task, uh, the, the flexion of the fingers caused uh, uh, more of a preferential activation in this particular area, which seems to align. So if you look at the difference between flexion versus extension, there is no difference in the sensory cortex that mostly was activated by flexion. But in the motor cortex, it divided itself between the two different mirror images of finger representation. So, so you have this sort of macroscopic movement that shows this gross uh, differentiation in the motor cortex, which exactly is aligned with the mirror representation of digits. So it's extremely high resolution and, and a new uh, uh, type of organization that we didn't expect. And it's very repeatable across subjects. And sometimes we even see a, a third mirror representation. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, um, this actually lines up really nicely with once again the mirror where the where the flip in, uh, in in finger representation is, so so it just it, it, you know the, expresses the, the idea that the brain is organized uh, at a microscopic level and the macroscopic movements seem to also play off of that microscopic organization. Uh, once again, re using resting state fMRI, we're able to differentiate uh, motor cortex activation pretty nicely. Um, uh, this is just a, an approach we use of calculating the independent components of the time series, and then essentially uh, uh, finding a map and then taking the ICA of that map and doing this iteratively until we get down to digit representation. And we can find clearly a different digit representation using just resting state with the vaso signal. Uh, and this is, this, this is an important study that was done by Yingha Yu, uh, who was a visiting professor in my group at the time. And this is along the idea that the brain is a prediction engine. And here we actually looked at uh, sensory cortex in the, in the fingers. And the basic model here, once again, is that the cortex where the model of the brain and what to expect uh, is, is um, uh, uh, given feedback to the upper and lower layers, whereas the sensory information is given through the thalamic input to the middle layers. So here we were able to look at uh, 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 four digits here uh, of the, of the uh, sensory cortex along the fingers. And for instance, if we stroke D1, which is the index finger, uh, that's expected to be in, in actual activation in layer four of D1. And this is basically looking at the layer activation. And we see very clearly the D1 activation at layer four. And if we switch the, the digit, we get a different layer here. So it's that works. And so that's really nice. You get the, the thalamic input. But now for the prediction, we had a unique task in which there were two types of prediction. One is where uh, you stroked in a sequence. So you were able to predict uh, that your index finger would be stroked. You knew that your index finger would be stroked uh, in sequence. So if you, but if you did it randomly, you couldn't predict what would happen. And, and here we actually stroked only three fingers uh, where the, the person thought they might be stroked with their index finger, but there was no actual activation. Uh, there's no thalamic input. 
And then we did random with three fingers. And we found something interesting is that, so this is looking across these, these layers right here. And with stroking sequence in D1 to D4, you see all layers activated, the inputs and the, and the, and the cortical, cortical uh, input and the thalamic input. But if you stroke them randomly, now you couldn't make a prediction about what was going to happen. And so the upper and lower layers showed much less activation. And if you stroked uh, only three of the fingers uh, and, and not the index finger, you had a prediction here, this is the sequence, but no thalamic input right here in the middle layer. And if you left this out and did it randomly, you had nothing. So the very, very clean demonstration that yes, there is uh, uh, um, computation going on in terms of what you're predicting about what's going to happen versus what's happening uh, that's across the layers. And this is in, in sensory cortex. So, um, we actually applied this to cognitive uh, activation. Uh, this is uh, Emily Finn, uh, who was a postdoc in my group. She's now a professor uh, at Dartmouth. And she uh, wanted to apply this to understanding working memory. So the idea with working memory is that you have dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that's active and other areas. And it's just, you know, this is um, a typical fMRI activation. This is from Neurosynth in which we gathered of data. And she had a task. It was a working memory task in which subjects viewed uh, letters, and they either had to try to alphabetize them, which is a hard task uh, during, a, during a, a delay period, or just simply maintain them in memory. And then they had to give a response with a, with a finger press of, of the answer of, of a probe question. And what we found is clearly activation in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, but then we wanted to look at upper versus lower uh, layer activity. And what we found here is, is, uh, was unique in that um, during the maintenance phase, if we just looked at upper layers, we saw a stronger activation in the upper layer with the manipulation task, which is the more difficult task. And nothing in the lower layers that was, that was of interest. But when they only when they responded, so we had modulated whether they were actually told to respond versus not respond, we see lower layer activation right here. Uh, that only occurs when they respond. So, and in this particular case, both bold and vasa were able to resolve upper versus lower layer activation in green and red. So that's a nice idea that we didn't really completely figure out working memory, but we're at least we helped understand that the upper layer is doing this maintenance and the lower layer speaks to the motor cortex then to do the response. So, uh, and that just summarizes what I just said right there. Uh, I realize I'm, I'm almost beginning to run short of time, but I'll, I'll actually uh, uh, let me just talk about this one other study here. This is actually looking at um, uh, uh, trying to look at hierarchy of connection with visual cortex. And so we localized uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus, which sort of is feeds information into the visual cortex. We localize V1 based on the striogenary, and we localize MT, which is an area that's just sensitive to motion, which is higher up. It's a higher order visual region. And what we found is this, is that if we look at resting state, and if we look at just V1, so the layers, the cortical layers from upper layers, this is CSF down to white matter in V1, uh, this profile of connectivity is extremely dependent on the seed we pick. So in the lateral geniculate nucleus, we pick a seed voxel and determine the correlation as a function of layers, of layer level. We find that as expected, the LGN gives input into V1 right here in layer four. And as you expect, you see this hump in layer four. But if you look, if you take a seed voxel in MT, it feeds back to V1 and gives feedback uh, to the upper and lower layer. So you have a very different profile of connectivity. So in a sense, you're able to probe the hierarchy of the cortical areas here. And we could take this one step further, and Renzo did, in which he uh, looked at, this is a seed voxel and thalamus. If you take the seed voxel and thalamus, the entire cortex, and then we color code based on whether uh, the cortical profile matches this template, or this template. And the entire cortex receives input from the thalamus. 
But as you move along, this is a seed voxel indicated by the green arrow here. If you move along uh, the cortical ribbon, you find that areas below now receive feedback from these areas and areas above receive still input. And you can move all the way along, all the way up to MT where the entire, you can tell that information is passed along the cortical ribbon in this, in this fashion. So you can pull out the hierarchy. And this is a, a nice movie illustration showing if we're moving the seed along, more and more areas seem to show uh, this uh, sort of uh, feedback information as you go higher up in the cortex. And one other way of doing this, um, actually for the sake of time, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip this part. Um, and just to talk a little bit about our high resolution methods. Uh, so VASO has been limited to coverage of very small parts of the brain for a while, uh, but we definitely always, we, we certainly want the contrast, but we want high, more coverage. And there's several approaches that have been useful for doing this. Um, Renzo came up, uh, well, there's been other, other techniques called magic vaso, in which you don't necessarily have to meld the blood, so you don't have to wait so long and have an excitation. You can just have a steady state in which you vary the flip angle and just rely on the T1 difference between blood and tissue. And it appears to work just fine. So we're able to uh, collect whole brain 0.8 by 0.8 by 0.85 millimeter uh, resolution at least. Uh, a person in my lab, Yuhui Chai, um, has also uh, uh, developed a technique called uh, vapor that has combined perfusion and blood volume contrast using a slightly different approach and also able to get whole brain data. So, and this is sort of just an example of the whole brain uh, layer specific uh, activity. And, and you can get, you know, this nice pictures of, of, uh, of different parts of the brain. And you can actually start to, to uh, inquire uh, as to uh, specific layer profiles of different cortical areas. And not only that, I mean, this is where, this is the real challenge here uh, because it's so much data that you get now. Uh, typically when people do resting state connectivity analysis or even with naturalistic viewing or tasks, they, they chop the brain into segments and then they make this connectivity matrix and they find out what areas are connected to what. But now we have an added dimension. We have a a fourth, uh, a third dimension in which we uh, now each of these voxels, right, each of these pixels right here can now be expanded into looking at the layer activity uh, and how it connects to other layers in other areas. And so you have this added dimension. We've just begin, begun really probing this, um, uh, but this is extremely hopeful for, for pulling out whole brain hierarchy and whole brain connectivity based on uh, which layers are active, course, course uh, connected to other areas that have different layers that feed into different layers. So, so we're just beginning this analysis. But at least looking at the um, resting state profile, we can see that you know, in different areas, there's very different profiles uh, depending on where you are in the cortical columns. Uh, where you are in the, in the cortex, depending on higher regions. Some are receiving uh, 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 feedback, some are giving output, uh, some are doing both. So we're at the very early stages of understanding and differentiating these profiles. And I'm, I'm confident that we'll under figure out a lot. Um, you can also trade off spatial coverage and go faster. So with this technique, Magic Vaso, it seems like, so you can actually go down to a TR of just under a second and to start to probe blood volume dynamics if you want to. So clearly this shows that the return to baseline after a task in blood volume takes a little bit longer than with bold. Um, and you, that, that wasn't able to be done uh, using uh, Vaso before. Uh, so using this technique, you can go to higher temporal resolution. So at three Tesla, um, uh, this is, uh, so this is just showing the ultra high resolution, uh, ultra high field scanners. Three Tesla, there's many more scanners in the world. Uh, uh, and there's about 10,000 three Tesla scanners now. And so it'd be nice to be able to do this uh, layer fMRI at three Tesla. And it turns out, uh, and this is once again, work by Renzo and his group at Maastricht, uh, that 
um, uh, and also others. There's uh, uh, Markarika uh, right here in Sharinga showing three Tesla activation. Um, it's hard, but it's but it's not impossible. So that's just basically to show that that the temporal signal to noise can be as high as twenty in certain areas in, around the edges of the brain. Um, so this is just a, a quick advertisement in some sense because uh, Renzo is working on collecting uh, a, a really nice data set for the world to analyze. Uh, this is a whole brain layer fMRI connectome data set. It's an open data set that's in this uh, open neuro. Uh, so basically the processing tools are still being developed for analyzing this data. And so this is extremely rich data uh, that I'm hoping uh, will be analyzed by many different groups. And first author here was, was Anna Mueller, Anna Katerina Mueller. So Renzo has also developed um, a open access and widely available, completely available processing tool called Lan Laney. And uh, what it does, this is just some examples. It does automatic layer segmentation. Uh, uh, either based on isodistances or preserving uh, 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 volume, uh, equidistance layering or equivolume layering. It's, it's pretty robust uh, and that helps to segment the brain into layers. But if you want to actually understand the layers uh, and how they speak to each other, you have to segment the brain into not um, columns as we understand like visual cortex columns, but just into areas that confine the layers into segments. So it's a massive segmentation of the brain, taking the perpendicular axis down to the white matter uh, across the entire brain in 3D columns. And it turns out if you do that, you can do many different things. Uh, uh, it's as opposed to just simply putting it on a tensor map and, and expanding it, you can actually uh, dig into different columns, uh, look at different columns, look at the layer activity across uh, uh, within these columns uh, and, and you know, do whatever you want with the cortical surface uh, as you go down deeper. So that's a nice, uh, a nice flexible and robust tool for doing a layer analysis. And within this tool, there's also uh, built-in methods for, and I didn't talk about this that much, is doing uh, calibration approaches. So if you want to use bold contrast, there are ways of potentially uh, calibrating for the large vessel effects. And that, that has this uh, approach in it. And also, and this is very useful, if you know that the cortical ribbon shows homogeneous activation, it helps to smooth, not over space, but along the cortical ribbon. So this does up to, you know, this does any sort of smoothing along the cortical ribbon to help get a more robust response. It doesn't smooth across the layers, which would, smear out the information, but, but, but across the cortical ribbon. Okay, and it also does, um, you know, you can flatten and segment and pull out patches uh, as you want. Uh, this is just an example of, you know, taking a cortical area and then morphing it into something that's uh, more visualizable or analyzable. So, uh, um, okay, so with that, um, I'd just like to talk briefly about future challenges. Uh, so there's a lot of future, as, as hopefully I've indicated by this talk. Um, look, going down to layer level activity uh, in humans uh, really pushes the technology of MRI and fMRI. So we're still at the very beginning of developing more standardized processing pipelines uh, for layer fMRI. There's only a few tools that exist. Lanny is one of them. Uh, Lanny is one of them. Uh, we would like to map functional connectivity hierarchy across the whole brain. That's sort of like the, the holy grail, one of the holy grails of fMRI, of layer fMRI. Uh, this can also, there's a lot we don't know about uh, the complexities of how uh, the upper and lower layers are organized across cortical areas. And so far we've relied on electrophysiologic uh, um, information to, uh, to inform that. But 
it would be nice to try to use MRI to get cytoarchitectonic information about cell types across layers. So we know, oh, these are this this organization is similar to visual cortex. You know, this is the infragranular, this is the uh, 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 supergranular layers. Um, so basically, to use those to inform layer activation. So if we know that there's an upper layer activation, we know it's either receiving output or giving uh, giving input or getting input. Uh, we'd like to develop more robust, bold calibration methods. Calibration always gives up signal to noise, but bold is still a very sensitive technique and there's what potentially ways of calibrating it. A big problem in layer fMRI is multi-subject averaging. You can't just, like with typical fMRI, that's two millimeter, three millimeter size voxels, you can't just warp it into standardized space and then average across subjects because even at the level of layer, at, the, at that level of layers and columns, the organization across subjects becomes much more variable. So you can't, there is no standardized warping uh, that can occur. So it's a big challenge. How do you compare subjects or pool them uh, uh, looking at this spatial scale? Uh, we would love to also better, uh, and this hasn't really been done yet, but incorporating layer activity into computational models of the brain that actually look at uh, you know, how the brain you know, models the world and receives feedback. Um, we'd like to integrate with simultaneous EEG. There was a hint that I just showed you earlier that, that output activity is higher frequency and feedback activity is lower frequency. Potentially we can use that uh, uh, with our layer activity to, um, uh, to better understand the computations. And of course, hardware. Uh, we'd love to have more scanners that have seven Tesla or even higher field strength. Uh, we'd like to go faster with our, with, and, and to go to uh, more efficiently collect our data. That requires specialized hardware potentially as like local head grading coils. Uh, such a system is being built at Berkeley. Uh, David Feinberg is, is heading up that effort. Uh, there'll be more, I'm sure that will, that will happen. So, uh, with that, I'd just like to end my talk, but I'd like to thank my entire group. Everyone listed in red here um, has or will be working on layer fMRI. And our group also collaborates a lot with other groups uh, at the NIH. Um, uh, there's many different core facilities that we rely on. And definitely most of my thanks goes to Renzo. Most of this work was his, and he continues to uh, uh, really push the field. Um, he has a wonderful website called layerfri.com. It's, it's, a, it's a clearinghouse of, of extremely useful information. Uh, he's, he's really working hard to, to stay abreast on the field and continue to push it. So, so with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Very, very uh, interesting talk. Uh, so uh, another reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can find that. So we'll make sure to cover all the questions. Uh, but let me start with one question before we, we get uh, audience questions. Um, so you mentioned uh, a work at your lab by Yu Hui Chai on, um, on different strategies for imaging whole brain layer uh, activity, essentially with high specificity. So could you maybe talk a bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, Yahoo is actually developing a uh, technique that, um, uh, that involves a very different strategy. Like with, with basically with, uh, uh, with Vaso, you have an inversion pulse and you have to, to wait uh, for the blood and tissue signal to become differentiated and then you image it. With what Yahoo does, he has what's, uh, it's a common technique that's been around for other purposes called uh, Dante. Uh, which is basically a, applying sort of a grid of, of pulses and relying on the blood to, to perfuse uh, outside of those, that grid. So it basically is it's a different way of looking at blood volume effects, but also uh, he has perfusion weighting as well in that. So he combines both the perfusion and the blood volume weighting to boost up the contrast. Uh, and because this technique does not use uh, in a version pulse, it's extremely time efficient. So you can collect whole brain uh, data very easily. 
uh, with this. So, so it's very promising. Uh, it's not out there yet. And a big problem with a lot of these cutting edge pulse sequences is that you develop them, they're great, but then uh, it's hard to disseminate them because uh, you have to usually develop them into a, a work in progress and, and then it goes through the vendors and the vendors uh, disseminate them. But uh, hopefully uh, things like this will be disseminated. Oh, interesting, thank you. Uh, so one question on actually integration of EG fMRI. So I will just read the question out loudly. So thank you so much for your sure. great talk. Briefly, you mentioned that simultaneous EG recording with, lam with, with lam laminar fMRI for combining gamma or alpha beta EEG signals for the top down or bottom up processing to achieve the simultaneous EG fMRI, what would be specific challenges to combine with layer fMRI as compared to normal EG fMRI setup? And would you would, would the gradient artifact uh, be different for any specific high frequency noise going to EG? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, doing simultaneous EG uh, at seven Tesla, first of all, that that's also a challenge in itself because you have uh, some issues in RF heating around the EG leads and things like that, or SAR issues uh, that will be solved um, and are being solved actively. Um, and so the question is along the lines of, of uh, 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 combining with layer. Uh, it's aside from that, aside from the hardware, uh, I would say that the real challenge is, is designing paradigms uh, that will modulate EEG. And you know, if you actually have uh, the simultaneous EEG and layer from you're not you're not trying to localize the EEG signal. Uh, that's nearly impossible to localize to the level of layers. Um, however, you maybe you're using you know the predominant frequency to 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 know when there's output. Uh, feed forward versus feedback activity. So I can imagine having experiments where, you know, it's very slow temporal resolution. You're doing a task and uh, you might be able to say, oh, well, there's upper layer activation here. Oh, look, this there's a predominance of high frequency EEG. Uh, and, then, and then start to constrain, use both to constrain each other in to some regard to, to build a model of what's actually happening. But that's about it. I mean, I don't think that, yeah, we're not trying to localize the EG source. We're just trying to determine if uh, uh, if that hypothesis is even correct. If if, if the if the predominant frequencies can be associated with uh, upper or lower uh, or various profile activations with very well con controlled tasks, uh, that's the first step. We'll see if we even get beyond that. So. Great. Um, yeah, another question. Uh, so uh, um, it's from Jonathan Fritz. Great talk, Peter. If I'm right from your presentation, it appears that the profiles from different seeds either shows layer four or upper or lower levels. So is there a resolution? Is there a resolution that allows distinction between layer one versus layer two, three, or resolution that distinguishes between layer layer five and six? Yeah, that's a really that's a very good question and. And right now, our um, our resolution is is not quite good enough to differentiate individual layers. We're we're about at the stage of inter differentiating about four. It will also depending on, especially in visual cortex, which the where the uh, cortical ribbon is is about two millimeters uh, at the most. Um, so so it's very hard to differentiate individual layers right now. We're, yeah, we, you know, it's interesting what shows up. We have these predominant profiles of either uh, upper versus lower versus middle, and we might be able to get some sort of shifting to the to the intermediate layers, but but nothing yet. I don't think it's impossible if you design an experiment that might be able to modulate uh, one layer versus the other right next to it. You might be able to see a shift slightly, uh, but right now the resolution isn't there. Uh, we can do we can chop the cortex into maybe four segments, um, but that's about it. Perfect, we are at the top of the hour. So um, I'm gonna um, um, 
thank you again for for your time and thanks our audience for uh, for being here. Uh, stay tuned for our future webinars. Uh, we'll be, I think, having more next month. Um, so um, yeah, if, and if, uh, perhaps if you have any questions, I'm sure uh, Peter. Uh, uh, I know Peter is very active on Twitter, so maybe Twitter would be a good. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Or Renzo, please, please visit Renzo's. Uh, you know, this is his email. This is his website. He's 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 the leader of the field right now. I think. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and so yeah, we're all doing what we can. Great, thanks a lot, and uh, have a good day. All right, thank you, thank you.